this. But it occurs in a coordination with and often due to the environmental conditions in which the cells are found. So remember the example of the neural cells and the muscle cells? The environment will dictate in a big way what they are becoming. Because in the eye, for instance, that's the example that we're going to be using often, there are so many structures in the eye. The eye is one of the more complex organs that we have, other than the brain, right? So we have many different types of, of cells accomplishing many different types of functions, but the overall function is the sight. So in this case, the environment in which these cells will establish connection to one another depends on the extracellular matrix. Okay, so the extracellular matrix consists of macromolecules that are secreted by the cells into their immediate environment. Okay, so these macromolecules uh, form a region of non cellular material in the space between cells. And depending on the affinity that these cells have to that matrix, they're going to decide to bind or no. So the extracellular matrix is critical. Uh, as well in the embryo development. So cell addition, cell migration, and the formation of epithelial layer and tubes all depend on the ability of these cells to form attachment. And those attachments are mainly made with the extracellular matrices, okay? So in some cases, as in the formation of the epithelial, uh, this attachment has to be extremely strong. In other cases, when cells migrate, uh, the attachment has to be made, broken, and then made again. Okay, so uh, we're going to be uh, seeing some examples of that. Okay, so sometimes the extracellular matrix merely serves as a permissive substrate to which cells can adhere or upon they can use that highway to migrate. So it can be used to tell the cell, hey, stay here, right? Or it can indicate to the cell, okay, take the highway. Oh, X669, here we go, okay? Oh, you want to take the 17? Well, if you take the 17, you gotta go this way and you wanna end up somewhere else. Right, so this is the matrix. Is the extracellular matrix is guiding those cells would have an affinity. So, for instance, the way is very well paved until a certain point, and depending on the type of cells, they're gonna have or continue on the very well paved road, or they're gonna divert. Okay. Okay. So, um, in other cases, it provides a direction for cells uh, movement or the signal for the development of it, okay? So overall, extracellular matrices are made up basically of either collagen, proteoglycans, and specialized glycoproteins like fibronectin and laminin. And we're gonna be talking particularly about these two at the end, fibronectin and laminin. They are responsible for organizing the matrix and cells into order structures. There we go. Okay, so pro proteoglycans, they are uh, very important signals in the delivery of paracrine factors. Okay, so we have two of the most widespread proteoglycans are heparin sulfate and one molecule that uh, a lot of know, know the name, this chondrotrim sulfate. These two are the most known in our system. The first one, heparin sulfate, can bind many membranes of the transforming growth factor. This transforming growth factor from now on, I normally gonna call it the TGF beta, okay? 
It also binds to um, the windlass, the WNT. Don't worry, we're going to be looking at this in a couple of minutes. And it also binds to the fibroblast growth factor, or the FGF. So these three families, the TGF beta, windlass, and fibroblast growth factor are one of the most important molecules that we want to see uh, in this course, determining the fate of cells and helping for the formation of the embryos, okay? <clears throat> so these normally are found in high concentrations, so that's how they can guide for presenting these paracrine factors. Mutations preventing the synthesis of proteoglycans seem to be related with abnormal cell migration, morphogenesis, and failure for cell differentiation. One function of fibronectin, that is one of the other molecules, is to serve as a general adhesive molecule uh, linking cells to one another and to other substances like uh, <coughs> collagen, excuse me, and proteoglycans. So fibronectin has uh, several distinct uh, binding sites, and we want to see this uh, through the course. And their interaction with the aggregate molecules result from uh, the proper alignment of cells with the extracellular matrix. And that's what we see in here. This line in green is the road paved by uh, fibronectin in this embryo, in Synopsis. Mm -hmm. So these are being... Uh, labeled with fluorescent uh, antibodies for fibronectin. And we see that during cell migration, here we are ha we have a blastula, okay? This is the blastocele, and this is the archenteron during the movement of a peebly that we described already, okay? And we see that as the cells start migrating by a peebly, this is the yolk plant, we see a path just there and nowhere else, okay? So in this case, we know that fibronectin has an important role in cell migration because it's guiding the cells which way they need to migrate. It's like the roads that have been paved for those cells, okay? So fibronectin path lead germ cells to the gonads, for instance. The heart cells gonna align into the midline of the embryo to be able to join the right and left heart together. If chick embryos are injected with antibodies uh, to fibronectin, normally the heart formation cells don't reach the middle line and two separate hearts will be developed. So this is just to show how important this fibronectin is in guiding those cells to the right position. But of course, the cell required to have an affinity for fibronectin. This figure here, what is showing is laminin, another large glycoprotein. is a type um, four collagen molecule also, that are the major components of the basal lamina. You all had anatomy and physiology, I think, or at least most of you had anatomy and physiology. And we know that the basal lamina is part of every epithelium, right? All the cells epithelium are on top. This is the basal lamina, and below is the collagen. And together, that's what allows the formation of epitheliums, okay? So laminin uh, in here plays a role and sadly the extracellular matrix promoting cell addition so this epithelium over here can grow and can also have the changing the cell shape depending on whether they need to adhere or no when we want to have these epithelial transformations, okay? Epithelial to mesenchymal transformation to a low cell migration. 
Then we have also integrins. Integrins are the receptors for the extracellular matrix molecules. So integrins are a family of receptor proteins that integrate extracellular and intracellular scaffolds, allowing them to work together. So here we have the cell membrane. This is the extracellular portion. This is the cytoplasmatic portion. These are the transmembrane receptors. And this is the internal domain. Okay, and this is the external uh, domain. And look where we have our uh, fibronectin. Okay, so the fibronectin receptor complex bind fibronectin on the outside of uh, the cell. <coughs> Excuse me, and the cytoskeleton proteins inside. So we have this integrin unit here. We have a beta and we have an alpha, and that's what allows these scaffolds to be able to join and give some stability to this epithelium that is being formed in here. Okay. So fibronectin receptor complex appears to span the cell membrane and unite two types of matrices. Okay, so all of these make part of this extracellular matrix and this binding to this type of cell. So on the outside of the cell, it binds to fibronectin. That's our fibronectin that I showed you guys a couple of seconds ago to this extracellular matrix that we see in here. And in the inside of the cell, it serves as an anchorage. So we have here this anchorage for the actin. So we have all the, of this is attached to the actin filaments that provide some structure to that cell. Okay, and we have, of course, many other molecules. We have vincolin, we have taurine, and other type of molecules that I don't want to spend too much time on it. But it's just to show that fibronectin with the integrins maintain the stability of the epithelium that we have here attached to that extracellular matrix. So this dual binding on the external side and in the internal portion of the cell, uh, allow them to contract to the actin. So we wanna see this when cells are migrating, they need to destroy this attachment, move and attach again in order to continue moving, okay? Um, the chondrocytes that produce cartilage, for instance, can survive and differentiate only if the if they are surrounded by that, uh, an extracellular matrix and are joined by another um, type of matrix that has integrins. If they don't have that, they won't be able to uh, change and form. So this is very important in development. So I a couple of seconds ago I mentioned these epithelial mesenchymal interactions, right? So some of the most well-studied cases of induction are those involving interaction of different type of layers of epithelial cells with neighboring mesenchymal cells. And that's what we call the epithelial mesenchymal interactions. So we know that epithelia are layers or tubes of cells that are interconnected to one another, okay? And they can originate from any germ layer, endoderm, mesoderm, or ectoderm. On the other hand, we have mesenchyme, and the mesenchyme refers to the loose pack in connected cells that are derived only from mesoderm or the neural crest. Okay, just pay attention. Epithelial cells can be originated for ectoderm, mesoderm, or endoderm while mesenchymal cells, mesenchyme can only be derived from mesoderm or the neural crest, okay? This is important because when we're gonna be looking at the formation of the neural tube, we're gonna be talking about this. So all organs that we have, and that all animal have, vertebrates, mm -hmm. consist of an epithelium and associated mesenchymal 
group of cells. Doesn't matter what type of organ it is, always have the two, epithelium plus mesenchyme associated, okay? So the epithelial mesenchymal interactions are among the most important phenomena in nature, and this is what we see in this table. So if we look at the organs, and here we have the mesenchymal component and the epithelial component. <laughs> so the skin or derivatives of the skin, the hair, feathers, sweat glands, and mammary glands, they have the epidermis that comes from the ectoderm, and the epithelial component is the dermis that comes from the mesoderm. The limb, epidermis, and mesenchyme is the mesoderm, and so on. So we have a combination of the two, one that is mesenchymal component and the other one that is the epithelial component. Okay. So some properties of this epithelial mesenchymal interaction depends on two things that are the ones that we have in, this, in, in the board. So we have the original specificity of induction because we see that we have all these layers everywhere in our body, but how do they know that they need to form my nose and not my ears, right? It's different. So depending on the specific location, that's the region, they're going to form different tissues. And the second one is the genetic specificity of induction. So we know that genes, we have the same, every cell that we have have the same genome, right? But the expression depends on where they are placed. So we will discuss this using an example of the induction of the cutaneous structures in this image. So the first one was the original specificity of induction. And in this case, we are using the chick. This is um, an embryo that is 10 days old. And we are looking at the expression of a sunny hedgehog. Okay. So the skin is composed of two main tissues, the outer epidermis and underlying dermis, right? So the chic epidermis signals the underlying dermal cells to form condensations, and those condensations are these little dots, okay? So when we are cold, those little bumps that we see is like that, okay? So we have these condensations, and at the condensated dermal mesenchyme responds by secreting factors that cause the epidermis to form regional specific cutaneous structures like the feather tracts, okay? And that's what we see more efficiently in this photograph. So these are the feather tracts on the dorsum of the chick. And in here, this is an in, uh, in situ hybridization of sunny hedgehog. Sunny hedgehog is a paracrine factor, okay? We wanna be talking a little bit more about this in a couple of minutes. So with here we see the expression the dark dots, purple dots, of sunny hedgehog in the ectoderm of the developing feathers. But as I say, the same structure is everywhere, but how do you know that you need to form the wind, the tide, or the foot structures? So this regional specific cutaneous structure can become broad feathers of winds, narrow feathers like we see in here from the ties or scales and claws in the feet, okay? So it all depends in their position and many other factors are gonna be associated with. So when cells from different regions of the dermis, so this is the dermis, ectoderm, right, in blue, are combined with the mesenchyme, the dermal mesenchyme, okay? The type of cutaneous structure made by the epidermal epithelium is determined by the original source of the mesenchyme. So the epi, uh, epithelium of the epidermis is the same, but the source of these mesenchyme cells vary, and these are instructed to form different structures. Is that clear? That makes sense? Yeah, okay. 
The second uh, aspect important in this induction was the genetic specificity of induction. Okay, so even though the mesenchyme instructs the epithelium about which genes need to be activated for the formation of a specific tissues, the responding epithelium can comply with the instructions only so far as its genome is permitting. Okay, it's allowing to happen. So this property was discovered uh, through transplantation experiments, uh, and for this we use then two individuals. We use a frog, so we have here the frog gastrula, and we have a nude gastrula. Okay, so flag ectoderm from the early gastrula of the frog. So this is what it should be the flank. Okay. So this is the presumptive zone, right? Uh, was transplanted into what is supposed to be the oral portion in the newt. Okay. So this is the oral of the newt. And we did uh, the opposite too. We took the newt and we transplanted that into the oral of the frog. Okay, so a complete transplantation. Remember, transplantation is between among two individuals. Okay, no individuals from the same, no from the same individual. So what we see at the end, the result that they obtain, is that the structures of the mouth region differ greatly between the salamander and the frog larvae. Okay, so the salamander has a club shaped balancers beneath the mouth. Okay. And this is when we transplant this one into here. They just create what they were supposed to do, right? Even though this is the frog gastrula, uh, the frog embryo. And then uh, the salamander larvae had frog-like mouth bars, like the, most of the tadpoles, that is not like the suckers that they have in here. Okay. So the mesodermal cell Cells instructed the ectoderm to make a mouth in both cases. That's exactly what they did. They, create, they recreated the mouth part of the individual. Okay. But the ectoderm responded by making the only kind of mouth that it knew. I put new and quotation marks, right? Uh, how to make. So even though this part of the new should we create um, the balancers once it was inserted into the frog. Well, that's exactly what they did because that's the genome that they have. They have the genome of the salamander. So even the environment was not able to change what type of epithelium they should recreate. So, the epithelial mesenchymal transition, or EMT, plays a really important role in the transformation of the body plan and the differentiation of multiple tissues and organs in most vertebrates. This epithelial mesenchymal transition is an orderly series of events where the epithelial cells are transformed into mesenchymal cells. Okay, and this is what will allow cell migration. Okay, so this epithelial mesenchymal transition also contributes to tissue repair. Okay, and we're going to be looking about this when we're going to be doing the lab, but we're going to be talking about the planaria regeneration. Okay which is a part of tissue repair, but it can adversely cause organ fibrosis and promote carcinoma progression through a variety of mechanisms. So in this figure, we have uh, initially a normal epithelial cells that we have in here. 
where the cells are attached to the basal lamina through integrins, as we just saw a couple of slides before. Okay, so we have the integrins attaching the cell to the basal uh, lamina. Okay, so those are the injunctions that we're talking about. Okay, of course, catenins also should be here, right, because they are linked with these integrins. Okay. So they are attached to that basal lamina to those integrins. Now, paracrine factors can repress the expression of the genes that encode these cellular components. And this is what we see right here. Okay. So in this cell in the middle, it receives some paracrine factors that indicate to this cell to stop producing the catenins that is maintaining the link to the other cells and also maintaining the link to the basal lamina that they had in here. So they start losing connection, losing what we call polarity because they lost the connection between the uh, lateral sites and the baseline, okay? <laughs> And because in here in C, it lost its polarity, it can be completely detached from this epithelium and become a mesenchymal transition cell. So, resume. Normal epithelium can be susceptible to some paracrine factors that induce the air uh, the repression of the genes that encode for the addition molecules. Once the cells are not enacted to maintain that addition, you're going to lose their connections with the integrins and catenins that maintain the stability and polarity of that epithelium, and they become then mesenchymal cells. Is this clear? Okay. Okay, so now that we know that cells can attach to one another, depending on their affinity, and uh, that some of the pathways that these cells are gonna follow for the formation of tissues depends on the extracellular matrix, fibronectin, laminin, some proteoglycans. Now we need to get into how these cells really going to form specific tissues. That is the main focus of this course, okay? So <laughs> organs, we know there are complex structures composed of numerous tissue types. For example, the functioning of the vertebrate eye requires the precise arrangement of tissue, corneal, lens, muscle, nerves, and all of these are in just one organ. But the same type of things we want to find in other uh, organs. So such coordination in the construction of organ is accomplished by one group of cells changing the behavior of an adjacent group of cells, thereby causing them to change their shape, the mitotic rate, and their fate. So this kind of interactions are normally occurs at close range between two or more cells of tissue of different histories and also sometimes different properties and is what we call induction, okay? So there are at least two components to every inductive interaction. The first one is the inducer. The inducer is the tissue that produces a signal that changes the cellular behavior of other tissues. The responder is the tissue being induced. Now, we can see that not all the tissues can induce a change in other tissues, right? So you gotta be receptive to the signal. Otherwise, you don't need to change or you can uh, obey 
what the other teacher is telling you. Okay. So not all tissues can respond to the signal being produced by an inducer. And this is what we see here in this figure. Uh, this schematic is showing us the normal induction of the lens by the optic vesicle. So here we have our optic vesicle, okay, this section. So we have the ectoderm right here. This is part of our neural tube, prosencephalon, mesencephalon, telencephalon, rhomboencephalon uh, towards the end. Don't worry, we're going to see all this as we go, and particularly in the lab, okay? So, in the first point, what we have is this normal induction of the lens, okay? If the optic vesicle, okay, we know that it will become the retina of synopsis. If this one is placed in an optic ectopic location, meaning in a different place that it normally forms, for instance, under the head ectoderm, it will induce the ectoderm to form the lens tissue because it is placed in the right position and it has all the induction that it requires. Okay, now in two, here we have that if the optic vesicle, okay, is placed under the ectoderm, but in a different region, and in this section is becoming more or less the abdomen or the trunk, okay, the lens tissue will not form. We don't see it. We see it in here, but we don't see it in here because this ectoderm doesn't have the competence to respond to the new placement, okay? Now, this ability to respond to specific inductive signal is what we call competence. That's what I say, this section here doesn't have the competence. Even though the right inducer is there, this tissue here is like, it's like talking in romance, I don't know, between a Chinese and, and, and a Colombian like me. You know how much I can understand of what the Chinese word, love word is telling me? Not at all, because I really don't understand Chinese. Okay? We can maybe understand some facial expressions, but if it's just the language, that's what happened here. The actor then say, oh, I don't know what you're saying. I, yeah, whatever. Okay? In three, we have here is the optic vesicle is removed, so we don't have it. And the ectoderm is unable to create the right structure because the inducer is not there, right? So it's an empty vessel. There is nothing in there. And that is what is the negative control in this experiment, okay? So no induction because the inducer is not present. In four, what we have is we place another tissue that doesn't have the factors for the ectoderm to induce the formation of the lens. This is also a negative control because despite of the fact that we're still using the ectoderm of the head in more or less in the right position, this tissue here is unable to induce this ectoderm to form the lens. Okay, so this is basically to talk about the inducer and the competence of the tissue being induced to respond to the signal, okay? So competence, that ability to respond to specific inductive signal is a key role in development because that is exactly what is telling a group of cells what they should be forming. Now, because the eye is one of the more complex organs, there is no one single inducer for the lens. We have many other inducers, and that's what we see in this figure. Is the lens induction in amphibians, and we have an additive effect. 
we have different concentrations at different stages during development. And that is what we see here in the A figure. So we have the relative capacity to be in use for the formation of the lens, okay? And in here we have the time lapse from fertilization, cleavage, blastula, gastrula, neurula, and the other stages until we get to the adult, okay? And we see here that we have different inducers. One initially is the endoderm, then is the cardiac mesoderm, and finally, at the very end, we have the optic vesicle retina doing most of it, okay? So the ability to produce the lens tissue is first induced by the pharyngeal endoderm. So here we have our mid gastrula, so we are right here, right where that endoderm starts being active. Okay, so this is the mid gastrula, this is the endoderm, this is the ectoderm, and here we have the dorsal mesoderm. Okay, and this section is when we start seeing the transformation of the gastrula, all those movements, all those five movements that I told you guys to keep in mind. This is when it's happening. Okay. So we have that, we have the pharyngeal endoderm that is first the inducer. Then when the cardiac mesoderm develops further, you see here we start pushing to the sides and here we are in late gastrula. Don't worry, we're gonna come back to this uh, you know, later on. So we have the expression of the optics too. This is the gene expression of the optics too, that now it gain competence to induce, okay? So that's why the cardiac mesoderm now become more competent to create this. So uh, OTIX2 and PAX6 and other transcription factor are here to induce the formation of the lens right at this level, okay? And then at the stage of the leg gastrula, this is the OTIX2 and see how it increases concentration and it becomes a little bit more until the head ectoderm now become more of the inducive signal. So the anterior neural plate may produce the next set of signal, including the signal that uh, promotes the synthesis of this PAX cis here. That is a transcription factor in the anterior ectoderm, as we see in the figure. And then together, PAX6 and whatever it rests of uh, OTIX2 provide the competence for the ectoderm to respond uh, to the inducers of the optical cup. So here we have the optic. And now, finally, we have these other set of factors, okay? And these are uh, morphogenic factors. Okay, so we have the BMP is the bone morphogenic factor and is the BMP4, okay, and the FGF, remember, fibro, uh, fibroblast growth factor at number eight. And these two interact, so now we can form the lens, okay. So it's a cascade. Some initiate the process, and then we have an additive as the, the embryo continues developing. So here we see one gene expression is really important for the formation of different tissues, and it's in a time fashion. So if this optics were expressed early, we won't be able to have the formation of the lens. So timing is of an essence in development. Okay, so many inductions are reciprocal in nature. Once the lens has formed, it can induce other tissues. For example, um, the lens um, induces the ectoderm above where it is to become the cornea. Another responding tissue is the optic vesicle itself. The inducer become induced, and under the influence of factors secreted by the lens, the optic vesicle becomes the optic cup, and then the wall of the optic cup differentiates into two layers to become the pigmented retina and the neural retina. 
So it is so cool how we start with just the formation of the lens. And from the lens, we are able to induce the formation of the cornea. And then what it was in the inducer becomes the tissue induced to become the pigmented and the neural retina. So because of these interactions, that inducer becomes the induced tissue, we call this reciprocal inductions. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. Okay, so we have uh, two modes of inductive interactions. We have the instructive interactions and permissive interactions. The instructive interactions, normally we have a signal from the inducing cells that is necessary for initiating a new gene expression in the responding cell. It means that without the inducing cell, the responding cell is not capable of differentiating in a particular way. We have three uh, general principles that are characteristic of most instructive interactions that are in the bar and is in presence of tissue A, responding tissue B develops in a certain way. In absence of tissue A, responding tissue B does not develop in the way that it was expected. Oh, Awa, do you have a question? Okay. And the third is that in the absence of tissue A, but in presence of tissue C, tissue B does not develop in that way. Which means that it all depends who is the user and who is being induced. Okay, which tissue? Sorry about who, no, what is induced. Okay, so permissive interactions on the other hand, uh, the responding tissue contains all the potentials that are to be expressed and it's only an environment, which means a certain substrate, right? That allows or enables the expression of these traits. And this is where we come to um, my, my, kill, my kit tool for you guys. Paracrine factors. So how are the signals between the inducer and the respondent transmitted? This is the competence of this. So we have discovered that some inductive events could occur despite a filter separating epithelium. Oops, just give me a second. My mouse is stop, stops working for a while when I'm using it, and then I don't know where it goes. I need to let some people in the room. So where was I? Uh, yeah. Oh, we have uh, discovered that some inductive events could occur despite a filter separating the epithelial and mesenchymal cells. So we know that we need these interactions, right, between epithelial and mesenchymal cells for the formation of every single organ that we have. But there are other inductions uh, that are blocked even in the presence of a filter. So the researchers concluded that some inductive molecules were soluble factors that could pass through a small pores of the filter and that there are other inductive molecules require direct physical contact between epithelial and mesenchymal cells. Just give me a sec. I need to be able to see the few that have the camera on so I can see whether you are understanding. And I have another box opening. Okay. So, uh, as we saw and discussed uh, last time, we can have two types of interactions among cells. Juxtacrine interactions and paracrine interactions. For the juxtacrine interactions, we say that we need a contact, a direct contact between the cell membranes of two cells, right? With our receptor proteins, that maintain their union. 
Paracrine interactions, on the other end, uh, is when proteins synthesized by one cell can diffuse over small distances to induce changes in the neighboring cells. This diffusible protein is what we call paracrine factors or growth and differentiating factors. Okay, whatever name we give, these are these soluble proteins that are capable of passing the small holes in the membrane and induce a change in conformation of the other cell. So this factor is secreted into the immediate spaces around the cell producing the signal. Okay, now I need to come back to... And uh, this is what is very exciting about developmental physiology, morphogenic gradients. And you're going to read this uh, in the Planaria papers that are uploaded on um, Perusal. Okay. So uh, we have discussed prior, one of the most important mechanisms governing cell fate specification mm -hmm. involves gradients of paracrine factors. And these paracrine factors are the regulators of gene expression, okay? So such a signaling molecules that become ingredients is what we call morphogens, okay? Morphogens are diffusible biochemical molecules that can determine the fate of a cell by its concentration, okay? We discussed this in chapter number two, when we call uh, talk about the bicoid and caudal gradient in the uh, insects formation, okay, in the syncytium of the drosophila. So uh, in this figure, what we have is the specification of uniform cells in three cell types by morphogen gradients, okay. So this is the amount of morphogen from low to high. And here we see the distance that these morphogens are capable of interacting or causing a change. And here we have the secreting cell. This is the source of the cell, okay? So a morphogenic paracrine factor in yellow, oops, wrong button, okay? So this is the secreting uh, cell in here. So we have the ones that are closest to it going to be greatly affected. So it has a high concentration. That's the threshold number one. Okay. So they are active. They're going to activate certain genes because the morphogen is found in great amount. Cells that are exposed to an intermediate concentration of these morphogens, and it's simply because they are a little farther away from the secreting cell, okay? These cells are going to activate a different set of genes than the ones that were induced in here, just because they have less quantities of that morphogen. Now, cells that are exposed to lesser concentration of this morphogen, just because they are farther away, they're gonna activate a set, a, a third set of genes that are here labeled in blue. So this illustrates the fact that when the concentration of a specific morphogen falls below a critical threshold, a different fate of the cells will be specified. That makes sense? Okay. So, regulation by gradients of Parker and factor concentration was demonstrated in the figure that we see here. So, the specification of different mesoderma uh, cell types in Synopsis, this is always Synopsis, is one of the best models to, to work in uh, for developmental biology. Um, so different uh, mesodermal cell types um, were activated by a paracrine factor of the TGF-beta family. 
that we will see uh, in a couple of slides, okay? So when beads, these are the beads in gray. So when beads uh, secreting, activating, uh, were placed on unspecified cells from the early embryo. So this is unspecified cells. We put just beads with no activin uh, in there. What happened in here uh, is an early embryo. So remember, an early embryo can have different type of uh, a compensation, right? Uh, it induces expression of different structures of the frog. However, the effect varies depending on the concentration of the activin. In here, in B, and what we have is beads that contain one nanomolar of activin, and this elicits the expression of expra, okay, uh, in the nearby cells. So these are here, and the cells that are closest to the beads are the ones that have changed, right? That's what we have this uh, little pinky color in there. And they become muscle, okay? So lower concentrations, because these are farther away, have failed to activate genes and cells were instructed to create blood vessels and heart. So we have a different type of, of thing. So the activin change because they were, they were farther away from where they should. Now in C, we have beads with a higher level of activin. Now it's four times higher, it's for nano. Uh, just give me a second. Then. Sorry, one of us needs to go and pick up my son, and I'm lecturing, so it's the other half that needs to do it. <laughs> like that. Um, so in this case, these beads contain four uh, nanomolar of activin, and this elicits the expression, once again, of X bra closest to uh, the cells, but also elicits the expression of cells to become muscles, Okay, and uh, in a little farther away, we have the expression of goscoid. So this is another expression here of the goscoid. It's a little farther away, right, in this section. And it produces a transcription factor that will create the, the dorsal part of the embryo. Okay, so now, now that we know which paracrines and morphogens are, now we can focus a little bit more on our paracrine factors. And as I say, I am not pretending you learned this by heart. And uh, now we want to see this again and again and again until the end of the course. Okay, so don't worry too much about it. So we have four families of paracrine factors that we're going to repeat from now on. And it is the fibroblast growth factor, FGF, the hedgehog family, where we find three different types in the vertebrates. We have the desert hedgehog protein, we have the Indian hedgehog protein, and we have our famous sonic hedgehog protein. And yes, it's after the saga of the Genesis, the cartoon character, okay? Just because of the, the shape and all that. The third group of uh, family is the windless, WNT, Okay, and then we have the transforming growth factor beta superfamily. But before we go through each of these, we shall discuss first what is the general pattern of signal transduction pathways. And I'm pretty sure you saw that in um, cell bio. I hope, I think, I'm almost sure. So all major signal transduction pathways appear to be variation of a common theme that is the one that we have here in the screen, okay? Each receptor normally snaps uh, the cell membrane and has an outer extracellular region, as we just saw a couple of slides before, a middle transmembrane region, and an inner cytoplasmatic region, okay? So we saw that uh, prior. When a ligand that is a paracrine factor binds to a receptor in the extracellular region, the ligand induces a conformational change in the receptor structure, just because it binds selectively. 
this shape changes is then transmitted through the membrane and changes the cytoplasmatic domain. Okay. That causes a cascade or domino effect. Okay. The conformation of the inner part of that receptor, the cytoplasmatic domain, will normally give the receptor an enzymatic activity. Okay. Usually it's a kinase activity. And that can cause a the use of ATP to phosphorylate proteins to include the receptor and molecules itself, okay? The activation of the receptor can now catalyze reactions that phosphorylate other proteins. So normally we want to have one phosphorylation or two or three phosphorylation in the cytoplasma at uh, this point. And Eventually, that cascade of phosphorylation will activate some dormant transcription factors, okay, which then will activate or repress a particular set of genes, okay? So this is written down what happens. Now, let's see that in a figure, okay? And just let me get a little bit of water. So, as we see in this figure, each receptor has three parts. The extracellular domain, the transmembrane domain, and the inner domain. Okay, that's how we start before. We have a specific site that is the binding domain here, and this is the ligand or parkrine factor that's going to bind specifically to that extracellular domain. Okay. In this pathway, we only see one phosphorylation cascade, right? And this is only in response to the parkrine factor that binds specifically to this receptor and has an endpoint that is called the signal transduction, transduction cascade. So we have the phosphorylation here, ATP to EDP. This was the inactive protein that got activated just when the ligand parkrine factor bind and activated the inner. And we have here the act, uh, activation of the tyrosine kinase that normally was that's what I said and that I will give in here. And then we have a responding protein. This is the receptor for tyrosine kinase. Okay. So this change is almost transmitted from the external to the internal, mm -hmm. and then to the cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic protein um, tyrosine kinase uses the ATP to phosphorylate the specific tyrosine uh, residue, and then gets activated. Is this clear? Yep. So, and you're going to see all of the different pathways that you're going to see response to this same uh, model. So now that we know what is the general signal transition pathway, we can go over the paracrine factor families and see how they work. So the first one we mentioned was the fibroblast growth factor. A family of paracrine factor comprises near two dozen structurally related members. Okay. In this figure, we observe that a one member of this family is the FGF. Eight, we br uh, briefly mentioned it a couple of seconds ago for the eye, okay? It's a very important um, paracrine factor that allows uh, for the formation of the limb and the lens induction. That's where we mentioned it in the lens, okay? And we see here is expressed here in the head region where the eye is going to be formed and massively in these sections where the limbs will form. So this is here, this is the tail but in there, okay? So this, uh, these dark areas in the distal uh, part of the limb, okay, Chico, uh, we know that that expression 
is in there. It's important that this is part of the lens as we see in here. So when FGFs bind and FGF, uh, the dormant kinase is activated and the ph is phosphoresertan protein. So that's what we're gonna see now in this uh, cascade. Remember, I will never ask you to, to say this and luckily we don't have any exams. So don't worry about uh, this type of uh, pathways. And I never asked this pathways in, in class either. So no worries here. So some paracrine factors, uh, ligand, that bind to the receptor of tyrosine kinase induce fibroblast growth factors, epidermal growth factor, platelet derivative growth factors, and stem cell factors. This signal transduction, normally we have it resumed here in this little box, okay? So we have first the binding a specific paracrine factor for the RTK receptor. Here we have a dimerization, okay, of the receptor that causes an autophosphorylation of the receptor. So this is what we see in here, an autophosphorylation of this receptor right there. The adapter protein recognizes this phosphorylated uh, kinase, uh, tyrosine, excuse me, and activates an intermediate protein that is the GAP. The GAP is the one in nucleotide exchange protein. They're going to be activated right here. And then we have another cascade of things that are going in here where the GEF activates the RAS G protein. And this RAS G protein allows the phosphorylation of the GDP and so on. Blah, blah, blah. It's all in the book. Okay, and finally, we have a final product, the MEC. The MEC is for the mitogen activate protein kinase. This molecule here is capable of entering through the pores of the nucleus of the cell and activate the ERK, that is the extracellular regulate kinase. And as we see, in here, this one will activate the transcription factor, the expression, and we're going to have an end product. Okay, so the, R, uh, the RTK pathway is critical in several developmental processes in the migration of the neural crest cells, for instance, for humans and mice. The pathway is also important for the activation of the transcription factor to produce pigmentation of the cells of the skin and the retina. So whatever happens to this pathway that allow the transcription can affect any of those aspects. Pigmentation, and I showed you uh, yesterday one of the Pierre-Balbismus uh, condition where we have a, a, a lack of pigmentation in the middle part of the front and the chest in the midline, okay? A JAK-STAT pathway, um, which is the casein gene, is activated during the, during the last phase of mammary gland development. And its signal is the secretion of the hormone prolactin from the anterior pituitary gland, so during uh, breastfeeding. So prolactin causes the dimerization of prolactin receptors in the mammary duct epithelial cells. So yeah, we have exactly the same uh, pathway. And then the JAK2 um, the jack protein are hitched to the cytoplasmic domain and when the activation of the uh, tyrosine residue and the STAT. So we have that pathway too. Oops, excuse me. This uh, jack stat pathway is extremely important for the differentiation of blood cells and the activation of casein, as I mentioned prior. In here, we have a protein that is called JAK, and it's not JAK because it's a person, it's by genus kinase protein, okay? So genus kinase protein and the STAT protein. And a STAT is not because it's a STAT, it's because it's the signal transducer and activators of transcription, okay? 
pathway. So is the really important in the regulation of the human fetal bone growth, okay? So some mutations that prematurely activate STAT pathway have been implicated in some of the severe forms of dwarfism. That is what we have a little bit in, in this photo, okay? So in this photo, what we have is a condition that is called the thanatophoric dysplasia, where the growth uh, plates of the ribs and the lip bones don't proliferate, which means that this little baby won't be able to move the thoracic cage when it's born and normally will die very soon too because it can open the cage, it can expand, and lungs cannot fill, okay? So the problem is in the gene encoding fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. That's the FGF3. Uh, so it's a mutation in the gene FGF3 that causes the premature activation of the STAT pathway and the production of phosphorylated STAT1 protein. So this is the receptor that is at fault in the generation of this condition. So we see that it's a lack of um, proliferation of the cartilage in here and bones don't grow, okay? So chondrocytes stop proliferating shortly after they are formed and the result is that it's failing the bone growth uh, of this uh, individual and mutation that prematurely activate uh, this receptor here to a lesser degree produce the achondroplastic, which means the short limb endorphism for this individual. The second um, factor in here is the hedgehog family. And hedgehog proteins are used by the embryo to induce particular type of cells to create boundaries. And this is where we're going to be looking at this guy. It creates boundaries between tissues. So there are three types of vertebrates. Desert hedgehog protein, which is expressed in the Sertoli cells of the testis. We have the Indian hedgehog which is expressed in the gut and the cartilage, and it's important for postnatal growth. And then we have our sonic hedgehog protein that has the greatest number of function and is made by the notochord. The notochord is one of the magic wands that the embryo has for inducing so many different types of transformations and creation of tissues. So, some of them are uh, the pattern of the neural tube and somites. That's part of the responsibility of Sonny Hedgehog. It mediates um, the formation of the left and right axis in chicks, initiates the anterior posterior axis in limbs, and induces the differentiation of the digestive tube and feather formation. This is what we see here in the photo, the sony hedge pathway, which is important in the limb formation, neural differentiation, and facial morphogenesis. So in here, we see the red arrow right here is inducing the nervous system. So this is all related to the nervous system, okay? Then we have here the blue arrow that is showing uh, the differentiation of the gut is not the heart, the heart is a little higher than that, it's about here, this is the, the gut, the stomach, and then the black arrow, as we see in here, is the limb domain, what is showing. So Sonny Hedgehog often works with other paracrine factors for the determination of these tissues. So here we have Sonny Hedgehog signal transition pathway in invertebrates, here and invertebrates over here. Sorry about Chico. My son just entered the door. <laughs> so, uh, patch is the protein, as we're going to be seeing here. Here is patch and smoothen. Okay, so patch protein in the cell membrane is an inhibitor of the smoothen protein. So this is what we see the red line here is the inhibition that is caused by this two. So in the absence of hedgehog protein binding to patch, the smoothen is inactive and degraded. And the transcription factor 
cubitus interruptus. Please do not mix with coitus interruptus, two different things that have not to do one to one another. Okay, so cubitus interruptus in invertebrates, that's, that's the say over here, okay? We don't see it in here, it's just in the invertebrates, is tether, so it's cleave, okay? And when it's cleave, then it gets into the nucleus, okay? And this allows the PKA that we see in here, these are protein kinase, okay? To make this cleavage here, and then it causes a repression of the transcriptional aspect, okay? Now, when hedgehog protein bind to patch, it conformation of changes and releasing the inhibition of the smooth protein. So in here we see that it's not, okay? It's not here. And it's what it releases then the Cubitus interruptus from the microcubal tubes and inactivates the cleavage protein PK and slim. Okay, so we see a whole here the slim is not uh, cleave in here. And hydropalloid is extremely important in vertebrate limb formation and neural differentiation, as we saw in the other pathway. Mutations that inactivate the pathway cause malformations. Mutations that active the pathway ectopically in the wrong place can cause cancer, for instance, okay? Cholesterol is important for uh, the hedgehog pathway. Even though cholesterol normally we consider as a bad molecule, we need all to avoid cholesterol, right? Well, cholesterol is important for the formation uh, in the membranes. It's what allows the permeability of the mem cell membranes. Too much cholesterol is not good. The membranes become very rigid. Not too much cholesterol then becomes too permeable, right? But for development, having cholesterol is really good because it allows a uh, uh, hedgehog pathway to, to go along. So cholesterol is critical for the cleavage of sunny hedgehog protein. The patch protein that binds to sunny hedgehog also needs cholesterol in order to function. Some human cyclopia, that is what we see in these two photos over here, are caused by mutations in genes that encode either sunny hedgehog or the enzymes that synthesize cholesterol, okay? So cyclopia in humans uh, results from being uh, homozygous for a mutant allele for sony hedgehog. In addition, there are certain chemicals that can induce cyclopia, and that is what we see here, okay? And these molecules normally will interfere with the cholesterol biosynthetic enzymes. So in the lab, this photo, uh, that's what it says the book, is resolved from the mother eating uh, a plant early during development. It's an alkaloid plant that is called Veratum californicum. And this alkaloid uh, produced by the plant inhibits cholesterol synthesis, which then we know that is required for sunny hedgehogs. So we have the cyclopia. So this is the nose that was unable to descend. And then the, the fields of the eyes are not formed. So when we're gonna be talking about the eye fields, we're gonna be talking back again to this sunny hedgehog and how do we have a whole interaction to it all start into one field of view and then separates and then the nose can come into position. Winless WNT family is a cysteine-rich glycoprotein is active in inducing the dorsal cells of soul mites to become a muscle, and is involved in a specification of the midbrain cells. This willless pathway family is also critical for the establishment of the polarity of insects and vertebrate limbs. Oh, look at that Pianica, it's so cute. <laughs> 
And uh, so windlets are also used in several steps uh, in the formation of the urogenital system development. And this is what we have in uh, the image here. So WNT4 are, is necessary for the formation of uh, the female sex determination, and that will be our next uh, subject, uh, sex differentiation, okay? So WNT4, windless four expression, normally it starts at day 14 in the embryonic development. So it's very, very early if, if you look at it, okay? And in here in mice, it's normally uh, coming in, um, in the male. So this is the mesenchyme. These purple dots are the mesenchyme. This is the kidney rudiment, and this is the testis rudiment, okay? So if we have the expression of WNT, we see completely organ development and separation. This is the kidney, this is the adrenal glands, and these are the gonads. In C here, we have a mutant for WNT4. This is a knockout that it, it was made for this gene. And then we have the kidneys fail to form. We have the gonad, and here we have some sort of rudiment of kidney, but it completely fails to form which indicates that windless four is absolutely required for the formation of the kidneys. So how this signaling pathway works. So this um, WNT family interacts with a pair of transmembrane receptors that are two. So we have frizzle here in purple, and we have then this one that is the LRP5, okay? which is a circle here. So the WNT pathway is different from the other three we mentioned so far, because this one involves an inhibitor. The other one, we didn't have any inhibitor during the pathway, and here we have an inhibitor. Uh, and we have an activation of the inhibitor. So in this first image, what we have is in the absence of WNT, the transcriptional factor B catenine, which have right here, okay, is constantly degraded by the protein degradation complex containing several. So we have axin, we have the GSK, we have the APC, this is the complex, okay? And beta catenine is degraded all the way through by this complex over here, okay? And we also have the glycogen kinase, that does the GSK, that is helping with this inhibition. So this glycogen um, synthase kinase 3 uh, phosphorylates beta catenin, which is the red one over here, so that it will be recognized and degraded by the proteasomes, okay? And at the end, WNT responsive genes uh, begin uh, and to be repressed, and the then, <coughs> excuse me, we have a transcription factor of the TCF that is here inside of the nuclear, which normally just don't, is not activated. Oh, I have uh, points that I, I forgot. Okay, so what happens now when we have WNT? So the WNT binds to a frizzle. So we have the frizzle, we have the shovel. So we have the activation of these two. This is with no, this is the image that we just previously saw, and this is with WNT attached. Okay. So this complex now activates the shovel that wasn't active here. You see, it's inactive, and here it just become active with frizzle. Okay, and then it binds to axin. Axin was over here. Now that WNT attached, now it becomes part of the complex trans uh, in the inside of the domain. Okay, and axin allows uh, to become an inhibitor of the glycogen synthase kinase. Okay, so now this is not any longer there. Okay, remember that if uh, GSK were in act, was active, excuse me, 
it will prevent the dissociation of the beta catenin and it will be degrade, but now it won't. So by inhibiting the uh, GSK3, WNT signal frees the beta catenin. Now beta catenin is free. This is what we have. And then it gets into the nucleus, it associates with the TCF protein in the nucleus and become an active transcription factor. Okay, so we inhibit GSK and the pathogen goes on. There is an alternative pathway that we see here in C, uh, where is calcium dependent. Okay, so this is called the canonical pathway. And this pathway regulates cell morphology, division, and movement. So certain WNT proteins activate a result to activate the shovel. This is what we have here, and here gets activated again. And in this case, there is no beta catenin as we had it before in this pathway. And I think I need to click, oops, too much. Okay, so in this case, the GTSP uh, coordinates changes in the cytoplasmic uh, skeleton, and this pathway depends a lot on the calcium. So we're gonna have a lot of calcium, and calcium will be doing the regulation of the pathway. This is a canonical, and it's kind of recurring in two. Last one, but not least, we are so close to finish, I'm sorry. It's important for the regulation and formation of the extracellular matrix between cells, the extracellular matrix that we described at the beginning of uh, today's class, that regulates cell division. So it also, some books say that it may be critical in controlling where and when epithelial branch uh, to form clots, uh, like the kidneys and the lungs and salivary glands that come in pairs, right? So this is what this pathway of the GFT, uh, TGF super uh, family comes uh, to play. So the effect of individual TGF betas are difficult to sort out because members of this family appear to function similarly and can compensate for losses of others when expressing together. So within this uh, super family, one of the ones that we're going to be talking a lot is the bone morphogenic uh, protein, the BMPs, okay? It also works in a gradient, anterior, posterior, and so on. So for instance, the um, BMP4 that we saw no long ago, okay, causes bone formation in some tissues, but in order, it causes cell death, and other specifies the epidermis. So depending on the location, their action can be different, okay? On the other hand, for instance, we have the BMP7, which is important in neural tube polarity, kidney development, and sperm formation. So we see that it's, a, it's, it's so vast, the, the amount of functions that it can have, okay? There are other paracrine factors, most fit into the above four groups, but some have no close <laughs> relative. So we have here the epidermal growth factor, the hepatocyte growth factor, neurotrophin, the stem cell factors. Um, we also have two that are called nodal and actinin. We're going to be talking a lot about them. There, these are two different proteins that are extremely important in specifying the different regions of the mesoderm for distinguishing between the left and right. This is not that in particular. It would be important to determine which side is the left and which side is the right side of the embryo. Okay? But we're going to be talking about that uh, later. So members of the TGF uh, beta superfamily of paracrine factor activate mem uh, members of the SMAD family of transcription factors, okay? So this is what we see here in this image. So we have uh, the TGF beta ligand bind to uh, the type two, we have type one and type two receptor across the membrane. 
Okay, this is the GS box, and this is the certain thrown in uh, kinase domain. Okay, oops, excuse me, I want to point and I just clicked the wrong button. Okay, so we have if it binds to receptor two, which once it's activated binds to receptor one. Okay, and once this is activated, um, they become in close contact. This is what we see now in this figure and becomes dimers and bind uh, into the serine and threonine. And we have a phosphorylation occurring in this section. And then we have the SMAD that gets activated and then the SMAD gets into the uh, nucleus. And then this is what we can have. We have two different things going on. So what is SMAD1 and SMAD5 we have here, okay, are activated by the BMP family of the TGF beta factors. And then it becomes a transcription factor, gene transcription can occur. And then we have this MAD2 and 3 that can activate this MAD4 and then together become a gene transcription factor. Okay, So it all depends how uh, they bind what they do. Okay, last is the juxtacrine. Those interactions of proteins that induce cell-to-cell -cell interaction and addition of the cells without diffusing molecules. That is the case of the paracrine factors. Every paracrine factor is a diffusible molecule. Anything that is a juxtacrine is a direct contact among the cells. Okay, so cell membrane proteins one on one cell surface will interact with the receptor proteins of a cell that is on the side. Juxtapose. So there are three different types. So we have a protein on one cell membrane binds to a receptor on the adjacent cell membrane. Two, a receptor on the cell bind to its ligand on the extracellular matrix secreted by another cell. Or three, a signal is transmitted directly from one from the cytoplasma of one cell through a small holes into the cytoplasm of the adjacent cell. And this is the example of the notch uh, pathway. Okay, so we have notch, this is one cell, this is the other cell, this is notch, and this is the protease. When delta and notch interact, then this protease will cut the intracytoplasmatic domain, and that will become the transcription factor. Okay, so in this case, it will come into the cell and gene transcription can occur. Okay. Now, mutation in notch proteins can cause nervous system abnormalities in many humans, like Alzheimer's disease, for instance, is one of those that the notch pathway is really important. Notch is also involved in the formation of the kidneys, the pancreas, and the heart. So, we survived. We just got to our last slide. Communication among cells is critical for building tissues and organs. We saw how there is a mechanism that explains how the molecular products produced by a group of cells can change in expression and cytoskeletal arrangement in neighboring cells. Mm -hmm. Cells communicate through diffusible paracrine factors and member-associated juxtacrine factors. As we continue through the course, we will find that induction and competence provide the core for morphogenesis. And we will also see that the same signal transduction pathways occurs within all animal embryos. And with that, we are done and we survive. And just let me, okay, just need my mouse to do what I'm telling it to do. And I know that it was long, but I prefer to give this lecture in one shot 
instead of cut it enough. And that's what I always lecture this during the lab session because I, it allows me to go from A to Z with non-stop other than Chico barking on the, on the back. Uh, but as I say, don't fear all of this so much molecular biology in here. This was the kill the kit tool for you. You want to be talking about all of this factor as we progress. So we're going to have sufficient time to assimilate slowly what each of them will do and how malleable these molecules can be or how these transcription factors can interact. And in here they form this, but when they interact with something else, they can form a different tissue, okay? So you want to see that it, it will become easier as we go. I know that the two hours here is like, oh my God, I have a headache. Go and grab a beer or a wine. And then don't think about it. Okay, just relax. Unfortunately, I can't do that. I have a meeting with my master's student next in five minutes. So, but I will be drinking some beer after this. Uh, okay, so you have now your toolkit with the information. At least these names will become more familiar with as we progress through the course. And you're going to be able to see, oh, that's what she said about conditional. This is what she talked about. That. Okay, so it, it will baby steps as we go. Okay, for now, we're going to leave it there. I'm going to heat up my coffee so I can talk it at my next meeting. And I wish you a very productive and perhaps relaxed weekend. Okay, with the temperature today, it's like two outside. My goodness, this is, I have never seen this weather at this time of the year here in Canada. So, see you guys. Try to resource yourself a little bit, keep safe, especially, and see you on Monday. Oh, at the end, I want to be uh, sending the, uh, the topics at one point today or tomorrow. It all depends how tired I am at the, at the end of my next meeting. Okay? Okay, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. You too. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank you.